Hello everyone, we are at We Have Your Waste Fest and we are here with Matthew Moss who is, runs the channel The Armor's Bench and we'll ask him how you operate the pier and then some follow-up questions. Great. Uh, so basically the pier is a, um, a spigot mortar. Uh, it was Britain's primary anti infantry anti-tank weapon during the Second World War, the latter half, 1943 onwards. Um, most people just assume it's a big spring-powered um, anti-tank weapon, that's not the case at all. Um, there is a, a, a sizable spring in the in the back end of these, but that's not what propels the actual round itself. So to explain how it works, it's a, it's a dynamic spigot, which means the spigot moves. Uh, and what happens is you load a bomb, one of these, onto the tray. And with the weapon already cocked, uh, I'll talk about that in a moment because it's quite an interesting um, side note. Pull the trigger, the spring goes forward, the spigot moves forward, and then in the tray here there's a large rod, and that's basically, that is what the spigot is, it's a large metal rod, and that projects forward. A firing pin hits a propellant cartridge which is in the base of the bomb's tail tube, and then what happens is the bomb's tail tube becomes a pressure chamber, so that propellant uh, charge explodes, detonates. The gases from that expand inside the tail tube, pushing against the face of that metal rod, the spigot, and that pushes the bomb off. So it's kind of, it's kind of a really unusual um, system when you compare it to things like the Panzerfaust, Panzer Schreck, um, and the Bazooka, Bazooka, of course, because they're all rocket-propelled or recoilless designs. Um, so the pier is kind of the odd man out, um, and I've said it before, but really, it was a great weapon at the time, and that bomb could knock out, could engage almost any German armor, um, thickness-wise. So, and, and one of the benefits is, I guess you don't have any back blast? Yeah, but there's a little bit of a, a bang and a puff of smoke, um, but there's nothing compared to, say, firing off a Panzerfaust yeah. or, or a, um, a rocket launcher bazooka. So Somebody can stand behind you, it's no problem, and, yeah, and also yeah. you can find it f fired from inside. Yeah, totally fine for people to be in what would normally be for a rocket launcher, the back blast yeah. area. Um, and as you say, it can be fired from confined spaces, inside buildings, um, and that's, that's where one of the, 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 the real benefits of this system is, that during a lot of the urban fighting in Italy, in Arnhem, um, during Veritable, pushing through the Rhineland, uh, the, the lack of back blast allowed it to be used uh, quite judici judiciously in, in the urban role. So they, they, they could fire downwards onto tanks, they could fire from small rooms, um, and they also used it for a role called housebreaking, where they would use the round itself to blow a hole in brick walls so they could move from building to building. Um, so it's a really um, versatile weapon. It can be used in the direct role against tanks, so you can, you can aim it through the, the front and rear sights. Um, and then you also, if we turn it around, on this side we have a quadrant sight. And what this does, there's a little spirit level here. And what that does is you move that up and down for indirect fire. For indirect fire. Nice. So, yeah, that's similar to the to the thing on the rifle grenade on the yeah. Gewehr grenade. Yeah, yeah. Gewehr so grenade. You've also on the top, you've got this white white indirect fire aiming line as well. And what that does is it allows you to to aim quickly and get a bearing. Uh, the the front monopod kind of helps with indirect fire because it it should adjust. I don't know whether this one does. There we go. So you can get quite the angle. Um, but there's, there's, there's some great videos and photographs of these being used in the Po River Valley in Italy, where they're literally in a, in a, in a gully, and they're, they're well above that. They're on a bank like yeah. that, and they're using them as, as mortars because they're engaging German positions uh, on the other side of the river. Do you have any numbers or general idea how often it was used in the indirect fire roll and how often against in the direct fire roll? Well, yeah, from, from archival research we know that they, it became so prominent that they were using it in this indirect fire roll. They became concerned about the life span of the spring because guys were, were using them as mortars much more than they were for um, anti-armor roll, uh, the direct fire roll. So they, they looked at extending the life of the spring. So we do know that it was heavily used 
in that indirect flight because it wasn't designed initially to do that. Yeah. This site wasn't on there. The monopod wasn't adjustable. Um, originally, there was a, a single A-frame that, that, that didn't move up or down. Um, but we know that they, they started looking at the indirect roll very, very quickly after the design was, was finalized for the first time. And in terms of range for, for direct fire against tanks, what was the, what was the range? Uh, 110 yards, which is around 100 meters. So this, this particular um, weapon has a, a three aperture sight with 50, 80, 110. Originally there was a, I believe it was 70 and 100. Um, so this is a later um, rear sight. Um, in direct fire, up to 350 yards possibly more um, so you, you you get this at the at the platoon level you get a really capable weapon that can not only knock out armor break into buildings but it can also be dropped on any position enemy positions and and used it in a, in a in a position clearing role almost so I'm not entirely sure I heard that it has a rather bad reputation yeah it does. It's... why is that is it more heavy is it more well, complicated to use or is it just Bad historians. Yeah, so when it came into, into service in 1943, it replaced the boys' anti-tank rifle, which was a 55 um, caliber, uh, 0.55 inch, um, basically anti-materiel weapon, um, is the analog we have for today. And that was used to, to punch through light armor. And basically, that weighed, I, I, off the top of my head, I believe it was 35 pounds. And this weighs about half a pound light less. So it's still a very heavy weapon, and most of that weight's from the spring, because the spring is soaking up that recoil. So that's about and, 17 kilograms. Yeah, it's, they aren't light weapons. Yeah. So if you compare that to, say, um, a 2.75 inch rocket launcher or a Panzer Shrek, they're relatively light because they're just tubes. Yeah. Um, and then the round's loaded in from the rear, and that's, that's added weight, but it's negligible compared to this. With the Piat, it's a heavy weapon because it's withstanding a substantial amount of recoil, um, just due to the nature of the design, really. Uh, in terms of, did they like it? Um, we have lots of documents um, from the Canadians. They did um, what were called uh, battlefield questionnaires. And what these were, they were basically um, sheets that, that platoon officers and company officers were handed after action, uh, and they'd fill out what they thought was good, what they thought was bad, um, what weapons worked, which didn't. And the Piat actually comes first for the, for the Canadians, uh, beating out the Bren, which is a big surprise. Okay, yeah. But there's lots of, lots of personal accounts of people love hating them. They hate the weight yeah. because it's the only thing the infantry section and platoon has got that can combat Stugs, Panzers, um, dug in enemy positions uh, without calling up um, mortar support, artillery support, that kind of thing. They really appreciate the firepower that it can give to, you know, a platoon. So, and this is where the ammunition was stored. Yeah. So, so basically you had three rounds in one. Exactly. So this is like a cardboard carrier and it's one of each in each chamber. And then there was a, a larger carrier that had two of those um, and they'd be carried normally a lot of the time they were carried in um, universal carriers, uh, but there's lots of great photographs of guys lugging them around on, uh, on bicycles and in wheelbarrows and whatever they could find basically, because they are heavy bits of kit. And in terms of technical organization, you had one gunner and one loader, or was yeah. it yeah. so like the Panzer Shrek basically? Kind of, yeah. Um, typically everyone in the, in the platoon should be trained on it, uh, just like the Bren. Yeah. Um, like the MP42. Uh, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that you'd have a uh, number two that would, would lay alongside and he would load in nose first. The spigot's out on this, so we can't, we can't really do that. But you'd go in nose first through there. You might be able to do it, there we go. And then it would, because the spigot's out, we can't do it properly. But normally what, what would happen is the round would go in and then at the back here, there's, there'd be a spring clip and that would go into a set of guides that are just here and it, the number two would tap that down and the gunner would know it was good to go. So a good crew could get about five rounds off in a, in, in a minute, which is something that people don't realize with the pier. Yeah, because everyone thinks you have to pull the spring again, yeah. but you only pull yeah. it once. That's right. So in, 
hopefully you pull it just the once, you cock it just okay. the once. Um, <laughs> so they could get a, a decent uh, rate of fire fire going if it was a, if it was a good team, and it, the weapon recocked each time. So before you went into action, you would cock it, and you do that. We can't do that with this example because it's deactivated. But you would turn the the butt piece, and then you would pull the weapon upwards, and that would cock it, and then you would turn it down, lock it off, and that's the weapon cocked. And in theory, it should be semi-automatic in uh, in nature, so it could, it should recock with the recoil from the bomb that's fired. Ah, yes. Okay. So it's a lot like a semi-automatic firearm, where you cock it, and the the, the propellant charge from yeah. the, the cartridge that, that's fired recocks the action. Yeah, the time. recoil is used for reloading, yes. basically, or recocking. So you've got a substantial recoil with these, um, and it's a it's a hefty spring in the rear that that soaks up that recoil. Um, and the amount of spring in there is was mathematically calculated in order to provide enough for the action to cycle, but also it was about the, the limit of what the human body could withstand. Yeah. Um, so you get people saying, "Oh, it was a sh it was a shoulder break, a collarbone break breaker." Um, yeah, I heard this about the MG42 as well, but no. <laughs> really, really, that's interesting. Yeah, that, that that but that was not in the Second World, but it was Austrian Army right, right. or, or pre-Austrian Army like conscript talk. My, th I've not actually had the chance to fire one. I would love to, but my theory with that is, it's kind of like a shotgun. If you haven't got it shouldered properly, it will punch. So if you've got it in the shoulder nice and tightly, it'll just roll your body. But if you've got a slight gap, it'll punch you. That, yeah. that momentum of the, of the, the, the movement of the, the recoil. But I, I talked with Phil, he, who has one, and I shot his, so also with, with 7.92. And not really, it doesn't happen. I think the thing is, a lot of the recoil with machine gun goes into the reloading anyway. Yeah, yeah. And so we don't know where this came up from. I think it was mainly done I assume the myth for that might be that instructors in the Austrian army tell the recruits to do it properly, right. to scare them to, off, to, avoid, to pay attention to and everything else. Yeah. Probably along those lines or somebody really did it badly yeah. and it happened. Because yeah, it was like, because I was scared by firing the first time and basically nothing happened. Well, yeah. but, but then we also put the, the bipod in the different version that that the recoil is, is covered by the bipod. Because the second time I tried it without that, and then it pushed me away because I'm just not heavy enough. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, the recoil is, is substantial, but we've got accounts of guys that have fired the boys and this, and they said that this was more of a push, whereas the boys was a kick. Yeah. So it kind of supports the idea that if you had it shouldered properly and you were in a, in a strong, tight position, and you, were, you knew what you were doing, um, then it 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 would be you know it wouldn't be that shoulder breaker. It would know? be more pleasant yeah, than an yeah. anti tank rifle. Um, again, technically, uh, tactically, from the organizational level, you had one for each section, I think. You one for each board. platoon, yeah. One for each platoon. Yeah. Okay. So about platoon is about fifty guys. More. I believe so. Yeah, it varies. Yeah, yeah, it varies. It's varies. Yeah, okay. Two sections to one platoon. Okay. So yeah. Okay. Is, is the is the, the basic organization and they'd, they'd have one of these at platoon level as i said it'd be carried in a new vessel carrier or a truck if you were lorried infantry that kind of thing um so on the squad level there was no anti-tank weapon for the british no well this is it yeah. it if they if they expected tanks um or they knew they were going to come up against tanks they would deploy it to whichever section was was um going to encounter them um, but yeah, it's it's not a section level weapon, and we don't see section level anti tank weapons in the British Army until the 50s, 60s. Yeah. I think because I think the Germans issued the Panzerfaust. I mean, it was rather cheap on 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 squad level. Yeah, well, the Panzerfaust is is a weapon yeah. system that, well, yeah, it's inherently different, and it's a weapon system that becomes, you know, the antecedent of so much more that goes, you know, has come come since then. Whereas I was going to say it earlier on, but the pier is kind of an evolutionary dead end in terms of the technology. You can't extend the range anymore because they've reached the limit with the spring. If they make a bigger spring to, to soak up a larger propellant charge, it, it becomes too heavy. Um, so it, it kind of, the British realized by the end of the war, it's not really going to be the weapon of the future. And they start looking for something else. They look at the Heller, a Canadian design. And eventually, during the Korean War, they adopt the 3.5-inch M20 Super Bazooka, and that becomes the direct replacement for a time. And then it goes on from there with Carl Gustav, and then 
uh, rocket launches, like they lost 66 millimeter um, and that sort of thing. But it, the, the pier itself saw action well after World War II. Uh, the French used them in Indochina in a limited way. Some great photographs of them mounted on riverine patrol boats and stuff like that. The Dutch used them extensively. They, they refurbished a lot of them after the war um, and they were used in Indonesia. Um, the, uh, the, the, the Israelis used them during the independence war quite this was basically for the Israelis it was it was great because they had so few anti-tank weapons and they managed to get their hands on, on, on a number of them and there's lots of accounts of them being used against Arab armor and such you know okay I think we covered all or is there something you want to add no I think that's that's the potted history of the pier I guess so I didn't mention what pier it stands for projector infantry anti-tank um, interestingly, the Australians who also used it, so it was issued to the Commonwealth nations, so Canada and, and, and Australia also uh, used them as well. Uh, and they all went off in their own directions, adopting essentially rocket launchers. Um, well, basically, projector infantry and the tank, but the Australians went with projector attack, sorry, projector infantry tank attack, Pitta rather than Pitt. Okay, Pitta, yeah, it's kind of. <laughs> this one got, got, it has a different meaning as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's, it's a really interesting weapon. It's kind of misunderstood, I think, um, and a little bit maligned. People just assume it's some stupid English weapon where we put a big spring and it just, that's what fires the bomb off. But there's a lot to it. The development history to it is really interesting. Developed by, well, there was two, the, the whole development story is a, is a whole other game. So you, it was developed by, um, initially by MRC, um, an MD-1, Ministry of Defence 1, which was a research and development um, uh, cadre that was um, tasked with developing unusual weapons and, and meeting uh, requirements that the British Army had that couldn't be fulfilled elsewhere. And it was developed by two chaps. It, this was an evolution of an idea from a man called, called um, uh, Blacker, Colonel Blacker, um, LBS Blacker. And it was combined with another design that was similar, that was inspired by Blacker's prototype, um, that was developed by um, uh, a Colonel Millis Jeffress, an, an engineering officer. And they gave it to ICI, a, a British chemical company that had worked on um, the explosives and the, the prior design to this, uh, called the, the Blacker Bombard, that was developed by Blacker um, beforehand which is a, a big crew served weapon, um, which kind of tried to fill a gap after Dunkirk where they didn't have as much anti-tank guns because they'd left them behind in France. So they, they went with these unusual weapons and Blacker's spigot mortar, the Blacker Bombard, um, or the 29 millimeter spigot mortar was a key anti-tank weapon for a while. And Blacker and, and Jeffress's designs are put up against one another they're taken by ICI, and ICI basically make them a functioning weapon. They take elements from both, um, but they play a huge role, and then they go on to produce them throughout the war, as well as the ammunition for them as well. I haven't actually mentioned the ammunition. It's a, it's a heat round, it's um, shape charge, so it's a, a force direction cone um, that, that makes a, um, a small penetration. It's not a hesh round, so it doesn't impact and then explode and push inwards. Uh, it's, it's a heat round which punches a small hole through, um, and they tested that for the first time in saw action for the first time in, in Tunisia. Tunisia. Well, that's about it. I think I think that's the potted history of the Piet. Thank you very much. So be sure to check out his channel, Armor's Bench. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure. Thank you for watching, and see you next time. Bye. Bye.